Hi, good morning everyone. Welcome to Diet Canceling, an interactive webinar where we talk about cancel culture but with a meaningful and nutritional twist. So what nutritional twist is that? You'll find out later on. My name is Dorothy Saldura and I'm going to be co-hosting today with my partner, Ms. Rosalyn Arnado. Good morning, Ms. Rosalyn. Kamusta ka? Hello, Ms. Dorothy. Okay lang. So far, so good. How about our guest today? Naka-breakfast na batanan? Is everybody in a good mood? Let us know in the chat box. Because if not, then hopefully this webinar will put you in a brighter mood. So, Ms. Dorothy, before we start, I'd like to ask you and our guest today, what are your thoughts when you hear the words cancel culture? Hmm. Rose, ang aga-aga pa already hitting me with the complicated questions i know no actually it's interesting now um i think cancel culture is something that um those two words have really had a negative impact in our society today and i wish that it's not something that became part of the norm or part of the popular culture quote unquote um does anyone else have opinions about what you know cancel culture is about do you agree disagree what do you think about it let us know in the comment section below and the mga reactions to you about when you hear the words cancel culture. So, Ika Rose, what do you think about it, man? Do you think it's it's a good thing? Do you think there's something na napala with cancel culture? That's so true. I know some, some might be wondering why is this webinar called Diet Canceling? Well, it's actually because we want to do a reverse card and cancel the misinformation surrounding nutrition and diet culture. Also, because it sounds like diet counseling, which I know a lot of our R&D and Andy guests are very familiar with, diba? Right? Nutrition education is waving. So yes, that's so true, Ms. Rose. With the continual rise of social media platforms, um, information is just within our grasp, no? And access to information is within the scope of just one type, one Google search, no? Na na to na. It's a blessing indeed. However, misinformation is just easily as spread. And nutrition facts and nutrition topics are definitely not exempted from that. Agree? Indeed. indeed. Well, that's the purpose why we're here today. We got to know how to counter that misinformation with evidence-based facts. I hope all of us are prepared for what's in store because it will be a morning full of facts, fan facts, and tips and tricks. First, we will be talking about canceling lazy eating, guides to quick and easy meal prep, and second, cancel diet culture, nourish not punish. Sounds very interesting, Rose. I am honestly so excited and I hope our guests are too. Um, guys, are you are you excited? Pa react naman dyan? <laughs> crook, crook. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the reactions. Grabe, no? Um, I really can't wait. Let's go. Laban. All right. Before we introduce our first speaker for today's webinar, we would like to acknowledge the presence of our chairman, who is an amazing visionary. And when I say amazing, I mean it. He graduated cum laude at the University of San Carlos, BS Nutrition and Dietetics. He is also a Master of Public Health from Southwestern University, and currently, he is the Program Head and Chairman of the CDU DND Department. He has been teaching for five years and counting with Foods and Food Service and with Public Health as an expertise. Would everyone please give a virtual round of applause in welcoming Mr. John Rafael Aranias for the opening remarks. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Hello. sir. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Doing good, I sir. Yes, sir. I hope everyone is doing good despite of the pandemic. Yes, good morning, everyone, colleagues, and the family, students, alumni, and invited participants. I would like to say how much I appreciate the honor of being asked to provide an opening remark in this informative and timely webinar. And I should also like to thank the DSND practicums and Chonghua Hospital for organizing this webinar event. The objective of this webinar is to raise awareness and cancel the false information regarding eating habits, fad diet, and diet culture. To date, unhealthy diet remains a leading risk factor for death and disability globally. 
Now, in a study conducted by Bertrand et al. 2019 entitled The Impact of Coronavirus Disease 2019 or COVID-19 Pandemic on Students' Dietary Intake, Physical Activity, and Sedentary Behavior, shows that during COVID-19, the nutrient and caloric intake decreased and alcohol intake increased significantly. The physical activity levels decreased and sedentary activity increased significantly during COVID-19. During COVID-19, respondents did not engage in sufficient physical activity to offset no, the increased sedentary behavior. Now, know that due to the shift of traditional diet to westernized diet, we become a vulnerable group for poor dietary intake and insufficient physical activity and even sedentary behavior. And also, more and more individuals are jumping to the bandwagon of what's in, in dieting and trying it out without proper guidance. Recently, you know, a famous celebrity announced of having an 800-calorie diet that piqued the interest of the many. The experience of a pandemic may have widespread implication for people's health, and we are meeting at a critical political moment for global nutrition. We face an enormous challenge, indeed, but we also have an enormous opportunity to improve the health and well-being of people all over the world. This is not just the role of dietitians, but us, the nutritionally well-informed citizens. Today, Two experts in nutrition will be sharing to us very helpful information on canceling eating and diet culture. I hope everyone listening will come to understand the importance of your nutrition and live healthily ever after. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you, Mr. John Rafael Aranas, for taking your time out, your, out of your busy schedule to be with us here today and for imparting our, your inspiring message for all of us. Good morning, everyone. I am Gif Mambella, one of your interns in charge for this webinar. At this point, I would like to introduce our first speaker for today's webinar. She's an alumna in, from the International School for Culinary Arts and Hotel Management and holds certifications three and four in culinary arts and commercial cookery from Culinary Solutions Australia. She is also she also holds a silver medal for healthy basket live cooking category of Cebu Ghost Culinary in 2016, which was the highest attainment for that category. She is also currently one of our very own CDU interns. And without further ado, let us welcome our co-intern, Ms. Kimberly Yu, to share her expertise to the topic Cancel Lazy Eating, guides to quick and easy meal prep. Good morning, Ms. Kim. We're excited to hear from you. Hi, Gif. Thank you for that great introduction. And, you know, this is like new territory for me, so it is, you know, a little daunting, but I am very excited to be able to have this opportunity to talk in front of you about something that I am, you know, passionate about. All right, all right. So, Jilo? Okay. So, again, we're talking about cancel culture here, specifically for my topic. Next slide, Jilo. So specifically for me, it's going to be canceling lazy eating. So before I dive right into it, does anyone have an idea on this whole lazy eating, um, you know, trend? Because Sir John did mention a little bit a while of it, uh, did mention a little bit, you know, during his opening remarks, right? That there is like a decrease in physical activity, there's an increase in like alcohol consumption. So what is this lazy eating that we're trying to, you know, move away from? Any idea? Okay, maybe you guys don't have any ideas, so I'll just me, like... Me, me, Kim. <laughs> okay. It's a good right. door, what do you think? I think the lazy eating, and sometimes we think that when we have to adjust to a diet, we have to be healthy. Like, we have to make these complicated dishes, and sometimes we just try to, we just give up and, like, just do something instant. So that's what I think is lazy eating, because they don't want to put in enough effort. But that's just me. <laughs> Yeah, but no, no, no. That's exactly it. You had ex you had really good keywords there. You know, instant. That's one. Ex that's one thing really that um, defines lazy eating. So next slide, Gila. 
So as consumer lifestyles have become more densely urbanized, busier, and more connected, the rise of food delivery and on-the-go consumption has dramatically changed traditional food consumption and eating experiences. So when I was preparing for this webinar, I really tried to read a many, you know, many articles, many studies that are really giving confirmation or giving weight to the fact that this lazy eating culture is happening. So this text came from Philippine Daily Inquirer just last year, and it basically summarizes what, you know, what this idea is. So although a lot of people still choose to prepare kind of home-cooked meals, it is undeniable that many are opting instead to make the most of the convenience of the ordering system in recent years. So next slide, Gilo. So this includes, click, fast food, click, kind of restaurant takeout, click, and delivery. So like in Cebu alone, there are at least four different kind of food delivery systems that cater to more than one restaurant, while other restaurants have their own private system. Diba? I'm sure a lot of us here have tried ordering during the pandemic, and instead of them having, you know, through mobile apps, they'll just say, Sige, ma'am, mag-coordinate lang ta sa whatever nga, you know, other company or other app. I won't say na lang the brand. So next slide, please. So in the Philippines, like a study by DOST FNRI headed by Dr. Josie B. Uh, P. Desnacito entitled Eating Away from Home Among Filipino Adults, Association with Nutritional Risk and Metabolic Risk Factors published in 2018. So this involved almost 8,000 respondents nationwide aged 19 to 59. And please click G for emphasis. So this study showed that four out of 10 adult Filipinos in this age bracket, preferred to eat out over eating at home. So this is actually a, a lot, right? 40% out of 10. And even worse, this data, although the study is published in 2018, the data was collected in 2013. So this statistic of 4 out of 10 could be even higher today. Diba medyo alarming? Especially kita as mga, you know, NDs or future NDs that more people are choosing to eat out fast food, to eat in carinderias instead of cooking for themselves, wherein they know what exactly is going into their meals. Next slide. Okay, so this is just one figure that's taken from the study, just to really show you guys, like, what, what is happening. So you can see that out of a week, one to two times is the most common. And then from that one to two times per week of eating out, it happens most of the time from lunch, PM snack, and supper. So, you know, it's not very good. It's kind of sad, diba? So next slide, please. So just to compare our statistics in the Philippines to another countries. So according to American author, Eddie Yoon, who worked on a study with Harvard Business Review in 2017, he discovered that through his years working as a data analyst, he found out that with regards to cooking, only 10% of Americans love to cook, 45% hate to cook, and 45% don't care either way. But that's sad, especially for me who worked as a chef in the kitchen, to know that only 10% actively like to cook are, acti you know, are actually taking charge when it comes to their meals. So this 45% who hate to cook and 45% who don't care either way where do you think they're getting their food? Most likely, kana, fast food, delivery, ordering. So the change in food culture and diet is attracting attention, especially when you look at numbers like this. Actually, this 10% of people who love to cook, according to that study by kano, Eddie Yoon, it wasn't the case 10 years ago. This number was higher, but there was a decline in the last 10 years that you know resulted in this only 10%. So next slide, please. click. <laughs> so nowadays, you could buy many varieties of next slide. Now click, 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 three times G. So nowadays, you can buy many varieties of food from home cooks. And I guess you consider them kind of home cooked meal. Pero you don't necessarily know what is inside. So you can always ask diba, the seller, what's I sued, Annie? Or anong, oh, what did you add? Did you add anything? But you can't always trust the seller, to be honest with you. And I have nothing against home sellers, huh? Because like 
maybe let's say 80% of my former co-workers are doing that now. However, it is kind of true that you can't say for certain what are in your meals if you're always just buying them. So one more click, G. So this change in food culture and diet is attracting attention. So especially when this direction is heading towards a lot of convenience food. So here are some studies in recent years who are looking into this change. So what we in this webinar are referring to as lazy eating. So because circumstantial or because you know circumstantial or not this trend or this culture, there is a trend. It is noticeable. That's why you can see that there are studies happening both locally and internationally. So if we had more time, I would have wanted to talk about, you know, each a little more, but I'll just show you the titles. I have a you know, time limit. So next slide, Nalan, please. So it's not wrong to want to avail of, you know, these services because convenience and availability do define modern society. However, the danger is that people who often do this, who continuously and constantly eat out in establishments or order food to be brought to their home, face health risks such as obesity, hypertension, you know, um, um, heart disease, and so on and so forth. Kita mga future RNDs and mga RNDs who are invited here. We know this. We know that this is going to happen. In any case, we even counsel our patients or our clients about this, diba? We know this. So why is this happening anyway? And I'm sure even kita mga RND, we're also guilty, diba? We are also guilty of you know, ordering a lot of food for takeout or delivery. So nga man, why is this happening? So why? First one. Next, G. So there are a lot of challenges that are, you know, promoting this sort of lazy culture. And the first one is busy schedule. And I do think this is the most common one for most of us here, or the most common one for, you know, a lot of people. <laughs> so kind of. So many of us have other responsibilities or work a minimum eight-hour shift job. And this shift is not always beneficial to meal times. For example, back when I was still working as a, in a hotel, I would get like the evening shift. And this evening shift is from 2.10 or 3.11. And I would get out you know, maybe any time between 12 or 2 a.m. So you can already see that just my, my number of hours is not really ideal for a proper meal schedule. I'd eat like a heavy snack mid-afternoon. I wouldn't be able to eat dinner at dinner time because, of course, that's when our clients are eating. I'm busy. And then I'd get out around midnight. So that's when I'd eat my dinner. But oftentimes, instead of cooking for myself, I just leave, I time out go straight to a fast food restaurant, order chicken, order a burger, or even in some case with my coworkers, I, we wouldn't eat and instead kanang, just go kanang inum, you know, pa, wa sa kapoy. So diba, it's funny to think that I worked at a kitchen, to think I was leaving a kitchen, a kitchen, but I did not cook for myself. Why? It's because I was so busy, because I was tired. I didn't want to cook anymore. So it just became easier to buy food that other people have made instead. The same thing is also true for those with mommy duties, you know, daddy duties, mga ate, mga kuya. It's sometimes just easier and faster with our schedule to buy food. So this is a reality that this is, you know, one of the obstacles to that, or one of the things that are, is promoting lazy eating. It's good that we have to be aware of this. So next slide. The second reason, the second obstacle is simply that we're not used to it. And what is it? It's cooking. Especially for people who did not grow up in the kitchen, who did not, you know, as a child, you did not help your parents cook or had no interest in baking. As adults, you don't really know what to do in the kitchen. And diba, that's scary. Because, you know, oh my gosh, now I have to use a knife on my own. Am I capable of this? Will I hurt myself? Diba? It's scary. So kana. Instead of automatically thinking, oh, I'm hungry. What will I cook today? Instead, the thought now becomes, oh, I'm hungry. What will I order today? Kana. Ansa? Are you guilty of this? Maybe, maybe not. Next slide. Okay. So the third reason now is availability of food options. So this also ties into the whole, you no, know, not being able to cook. 
So in, mo in modern society, it is a luxury and a privilege that we can eat cuisine from so many different cultures. And sometimes our skill set is just not up to par to provide ourselves with what we want to eat. If all you're capable of, for example, is kana, making padsit canton and then frying an egg, kana, that's your skill set. But you want to eat kana, Korean or Indian, only a few people would actually go through the trouble of learning how to make these dishes and instead would rather order. Diba? This is a reality. Okay, so next slide. Mm -mm. So the fourth reason that I identified, and this one is the last, is simply the perception of importance with regards to cooking. And this, is, this boils down to time management. Okay, let me ask you guys who are listening to me right now. Have you ever made a to-do list of you know, things to accomplish in the day? You know, absolutely, you know, I have to do this. I can't miss out on any of these. Have you made this kind of list before? Yes or no? Sometimes. Okay. Not consistent. Haha. <laughs> well, me, I make a lot of lists. I'm very much a paper and pen kind of person. And I always write down the things I need to do in a day. But with that, let me ask you, if you have made a to-do list, how often does that list include make dinner, make lunch, prepare a snack to bring tomorrow to work? Diba? Not always. Oh, si Kyle daw. <laughs> Kasi cook siya. For not everyone does that. And that is simply because of a discrepancy in importance. To us, being able to cook or having to put aside time to cook ranks lower among the things we have to do today. Even if you have an hour break, a lot of people would rather spend that 20 minutes used to cook a meal, kakita mga students, I'm sure you're guilty of this, instead of using that 20 minutes to cook, you'd rather study a little more, finish that report, or even just take a 20 minute nap. And there is, yana, and there is, it's just because of mindset. It's because kana. We're so used to doing other things and because we're so used to having you know, everything come to us in an instant, instead of setting time to cook, you know, you'd rather just wait, do something else and have something come to you, okay? Pero, you know, it's not exactly bad because, you know, this is a reality. However, we need to be aware that these are possibly the reasons why this lazy eating culture is happening to us because awareness is often the first step to fixing a problem. So that's why we need to know about this. So next slide. So now that we are aware of the reasons, what can we do now to help ourselves move forward? What can we do now to not you know, continue on this lazy eating path? Let's talk about meal prep. So what do you think is meal prep? Do you guys have any idea what meal prep is? <laughs> if wala, it's okay. Cooking. So cooking daw. So next slide na lang, G. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. So meal prep is the act of preparing meals or meal components ahead of time and then storing in the fridge or the, free, or the freezer. So most people think, yeah, kana, preparing meals. Now, the, just the simple act of you know, doing the effort ahead of time, even if it's just you no, know, even if it's just putting the meat from the freezer to the refrigerator to defrost the night before, or buying meat in the grocery already kanang portioned and cut the way we want to use it when the time comes, this can make getting meals on the table faster and simpler. So there are a lot of different ways. Next slide, G. So there are a lot of different types of meal prep. And I want to show this to you guys because different people um, adapt to different styles better. So it's up to us to figure out what style works for us, what works for our needs and our lifestyle. So cunning. So I got this actually from a lady named Denise Bustard from a Sweet Pea and Saffron blog. I liked how she worded it. That's why I borrowed it from her. So next slide, please. So the first one, and I think this is the most common one, especially when you say preparing meals ahead of time. So the first type of meal prep is reheat meals. So what happens is you cook in advance, you put it in a Tupperware, and then you reheat it when needed. So I think you saw the previous picture two slides ago, Diba, and then each container had the same meal. So this is mostly what happens here. 
you prepare it, you plate it, and then you store it. Usually, you can do like most people do three to one week's worth of meals. So when the time comes when you want to eat, you just get the whole thing, microwave it, and eat. So you've done the work once and you have food for the rest of the week. So this is the first type of meal prep. The second one, next slide, G. The second type of meal prep is, is called the assemble ahead meals. So you can, you can probably get an idea already of what it is based on the photo. It is assembling all the ingredients ahead of time and then storing them uncooked. So you can look at the photo. It's like potatoes, it's garlic, it's like um, carrots, spices, you and then you have like your chickpeas. So most likely this person is going to be cooking a lentil curry just based on these ingredients. So if you do this, you can store like several different bags in your fridge or your freezer. And then when it's time to cook, grab it, put it in the pot, leave it to boil, and you're done. It's much faster that way. You can do this for a lot of things also, like pre-marinated meat. And then if it's um, a dish that, ha that has ingredients that cook at a different time, you can always put it in the same bag, but put it in smaller bags in that bag. So you have like your marinated chicken as, as the main bag, and then put it in a smaller Ziploc or a plastic or a kind of reusable be beeswax cloth, your vegetables. So at least you can like take it out and cook it in order. So that's another way. Next slide. Next, the one is ingredient prep and pre-portioning. I see a question and I'll happily answer that during the Q&A, but we'll do it later on. So next is ingredient prep or pre-portioning. So this is simply cutting ahead of time vegetables or portioning out ingredients. So this is basically, you know, just having your stock ready. And if you need cut up vegetables, it's already in your chiller. You know, I can just get like a handful of this cut up veg, this cut, this cut up veg and use it, you know, as needed. I don't do this, for example, for me, I don't do this for everything, but what I like to do is with my aromatics, especially garlic. Because I think we know that garlic does take a lot, uh, does take a few minutes to you know, prepare, to peel, to wash, to cut, to mince. So what I like to do is I have a small kind of vacuum sealed Tupperware of minced garlic. So if a recipe calls for, let's say one tablespoon or one teaspoon of minced garlic, I have some already on hand. So this saves me, let's say five minutes already, just because I did it in advance. The next style is G. The next style is kani, ang buffet style. And this, what happens in buffet style is that we prepare different ingredients ahead of time and mix and match on the spot. So this type of style is better for, you know, when you're cooking a lot or cooking for a lot of people or you have, like example, a function and you need to like make something or like a lunchbox for like different people. So this buffet style of mixing and matching ingredients gives you the illusion of having different kinds of food, even if gamay raimonggi andam. So just looking at the picture, you can see it looks like it's ingredients for like a taco. So you have your, like your pulled chicken, your grated cheese, your shredded cabbage, carrots, um, lettuce, and bell peppers. So this looks like it's for a taco. But with buffet style, you can make other things. Use the chicken, use the cheese, add it to a pasta, you'll have a chicken pasta dish. You take only the vegetables, you'll have a sauteed vegetable dish. So see, this gives the illusion of having a lot of different things with the minimal amount of um, you know, effort. Especially if you're going to be using a lot of different colors in your ingredients, it will even look more different from each other. Because only one dish will have the purple cabbage. So it looks completely different from a dish that would only have like the chicken, the cheese, and cream. So kana. So this is our buffet style. Next slide, please. So the fifth kind is this batch preparation. So what happens in batch preparation meal prep is that you cook a single dish in a large batch and then you base several meals around it. This is also giving you the illusion of, what do you call it, having a lot of different food choices. But you can also do this for like several days worth as long as your main dish keeps, for example. <laughs> so the batch prep ng photo, it looks like diba, it's pulled pork. So you make like a good size container of that. And on Monday, you have kana, 
pulled pork tacos. Sorry, I like tacos. And then the next day, you can add it to pasta, make a nice brown sauce, and you'll have a nice, you know, uh, meat ragu. Or on Wednesday, you can add it to cream, put it on rice, bake it. The next day, you can add a diff- you can add more tomatoes or tomato sauce, add vegetables, put it in the oven and bake it. There are a lot of things you can do with just one main ingredient. But because you already saved time on making your main ingredient, you don't have to think about what else to do because you already have your first step done. So it saves you time with that. So next slide. So these are the five different styles that I identified. And hopefully you can find at least one that suits your needs. Because it really is playing around with what we can do, what, what suits our capabilities. We don't have to be so strict with cooking. A lot of people I know are often scared to start cooking because it looks, it looks so advanced. Even people who just watch me cut something, you know, they get impressed because I work fast. But then I always tell them, you don't have to compare yourself to someone who's been working professionally for so long even you know just one step forward can already begin your culinary journey especially you know if it's going to end in what do you call it in like promoting healthy eating with yourself then great go ahead don't be afraid to fail don't be afraid to waste ingredients as long as it's within your budget because that's how you learn okay so kind of next slide please so I have a few other tips and, you know, hopefully you can also mix and match them with those other meal prep ideas that, um, you know, I identified. So the first step that I will tell you is to have a Rolodex of easy recipes. A Rolodex is basically like a card system or a storage system of like easy recipes. Okay, now. It's better to have, you know, a notebook or a file of easy recipes or recipes that you can fall back on because it saves you also the time of having to scroll. About what will I make today? Search, but uh, uh, this doesn't look right. So at least you already have kana, a journal, correct, Kyle? A journal of recipes to use. Because eat with anything else, so with anything else, diba, you can't operate a machine if you haven't read the instruction manuals. Same thing, you have same thing with cooking. So you have to at least have a little base knowledge to in order to do it well. Same thing applies. So the next step is to use colorful ingredients. So colorful ingredients we know, you know, enhances the organoleptic properties of food. So even if your excuse, or let's not say excuse, even if your challenge is you not having time or if you're you're tired already, at least know the Seeing a, being able to see colorful ingredients, you know, ingredients that smell good, these kinds of things, it will stimulate your appetite and make you want to cook, make you happy to see what can you make with these different ingredients. The next is to store your ingredients properly or pre-portioned. So if you've worked in the kitchen or have any kind of food-related background, you will know that different ingredients store longer if you, if you store them well. One example for this are your green leafy vegetables or especially your herbs. So these last longer if it's chilled, if you give them proper air circulation, and some even last longer if you put like a damp paper towel on them during storage before you know cling wrapping them. So you should be aware of how to best save or how to extend the lifespan of these ingredients because not only will it save you time, it will also save you money because your things are not rotting as fast. It will also save you time because you, you have to go to the grocery less and less because kana, you stored them well. So the next one is to make ahead marinades and sauces or chill and freeze them. You will be surprised. If you don't know about this yet, you will be surprised about the, uh, you will be surprised at how many marinades and sauces you can make and freeze. As in, you can freeze you, uh, you can freeze tomato sauce, you can freeze barbecue sauce, you can freeze oil-based sauces. So you, if you make them, freeze them in small portions. Whenever you need something, you can just grab it from your freezer. That's what I like to do. As long as it's not, you know, the basic rule is as long as there's no dairy, you can, you know, mo- more or less freeze them. Let's try to remember that. So kana, if I want to make, for example, 
a stew with tomato sauce, I can just get it from my freezer. If I want to use a demi glass, I already have a little bit in my freezer. If I wanted to use like a chimichurri, I have a little bit in my freezer. So that already saves me time and kana. It gives you so many more options if you do this. The next is to consider canned and dried ingredients. And I'm mentioning this, especially because I see Jilo saying, convenient kayo for my situation. So this is good for people who may, not, who may or may not have a refrigerator. So there's no harm, there's no shame in choosing instead to use canned and dried ingredients. So we have our tuna, we have our sardines, we even have canned chicken chunks. For dried ingredients, we have our dried herbs, we have dried mushrooms, dried tomatoes. We can use that. And although the downside is, of course, you have to watch out for sodium consumption and preservative consumption, in a pinch, or if you have no choice, you can do a lot with these scanned ingredients. Creativity lang. The last one is to prepare storable side dishes. And this is fun, especially if you're, you know, have a little more experience in the kitchen. So in your fridge, you can have like, let's say three or four or even two side dishes already. So this can include achara, kimchi, um, pickled cucumbers, pickled carrots, kind of marinated vegetables. So if you're feeling exceptionally lazy, all you can do for the day is prepare your lunchbox of rice, canned tuna. At least you can already get from your side dishes in the fridge. So your rice and tuna combination now has a little bit of kimchi, now has a little bit of whatever marinated vegetable you put. So this also saves time and also makes your kind of lunch boxes you're eating fun, diba. Right? And these often last long, especially if you store them properly. Um, especially for the NDs who are here, we know diba right? already how to properly preserve food through kanang, you know, putting it in water, heat treating it to make it sealed. So diba, there's nothing stopping you from doing this. I think that's the last for our next slide. Okay, so here I have a few kanang quick food combinations. Maybe you've tried them before, maybe you haven't, but you know, at least I wanted to introduce these flavor profiles to you because these are a lot of my go-tos when I want to cook for only 10 minutes, 20 minutes. So kana. For example, pork, adding grated ginger, soy sauce, sugar, and onion. This is already very simple, uh, very similar to like a sukiyaki kind of thing. Add if you add like sake or mirin, it'll really become like a sukiyaki, but kana. So these are like often things you already have at home that you can just, what am I gonna cook today? Grab, 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 kana. So you can just screenshot this if you want. And I did include measurements because I'm, you know, it always depends on good and how much you make, but at least you have these flavor profiles. So we have for pork and I have for chicken on this. And then next slide. So I also included some kana. Um, non-meat options for my vegetarian, my vegan um, audience. So I have also for tofu and I have some kind of vegetarian pastas. So even the tofu, the first one, onion, garlic, chili, calamansi, and maggi, that's already like a tofu sisig. So, you know, these are just things already at home. It doesn't and it doesn't require much cooking. Tofu cooks very fast. It cuts very fast. So you really don't need much time. So there's nothing, there's really nothing stopping you from cooking at home. I know there's really no excuse for, you know, falling into this lazy culture, lazy eating culture. So, kana. so next slide. So, so thank you for listening. It was, it's, it's not a very difficult topic, I think, what I just talked about. But hopefully, I managed to change your mindset, got you aware about certain things, and, you know, maybe pushed you in the, dire in the right direction to this cancel culture of ours. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Ms. Kim, for sharing your wonderful topic. I, may, I must say nga, makarelate should go sa imuhang quick and easy meal prep, specifically the pre-portioned ones and the quick food combination. Okay, <laughs> knowing other myself, so in times nga hectic ako schedule, so that's, that's, those were really great kanang kaan at kanang, kanang advice. And knowing this was your first time being a speaker to a webinar, how did it feel? 
Um, I'm still, you know, nervous. It is, it is a lot of pressure to be able to talk. It is a pressure. It is pressure, but also a privilege to be able to talk in front of people like this. However, food is really something that I am passionate about. You know, it's because of food that I managed to pick myself up from failure. You know, I started cooking because I failed the first course that I took. And from that, you know, I had no prior experience. I didn't cook at home. I had no interest. But look at me now. You know, I'm in ND. I worked as a graduate in culinary school. I won a cooking competition. And that started from point zero. So kana, I really wanted to help people also try this kind of experience. Because honestly, there really is no reason why people shouldn't cook. There's nothing stopping people from being able to cook. All it takes is practice. And that's where my thoughts. Yes, this and we are so proud of you, Miss Kim. Uh-huh. And hopefully one day, as your co-interns may be able to experience being a speaker to a webinar with all of our expertise. Thank you once again, Miss Kim. Thank you very much. All right, as we move on to our next topic, everyone must be excited, Tamaba. Give your reactions because I'm super duper excited for this. It is a controversial yet interesting topic for us all. For our next speaker, She's an alumna of the University of Philippines, Diliman, with a bachelor's degree of science in community nutrition. She is a Uniqlo nutrition guru, a rebel fitness app content creator, wellness speaker for Puritan's Pride, and wellness speaker for MaxiCare. She is also very active in social media, using her platforms on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, raising awareness about body acceptance, nutrition principles, and fitness. We are so thankful to have her today to impart insights into the topic, cancel culture, nourish, not punish. It's an absolute honor to bring Ms. Jo Sebastian R&D to the virtual stage. Good morning, Ms. Jo. How are you today? Hi, good morning, guys. I'm okay, I'm awake. Yay. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, hi, guys. Hello, it's great that you accept our invitation to be our guest speaker for today. So, um, all right, di ko na to patatagalin pa. You may not take the Zoom for Miss Jo. Okay, so hi guys. Good um, morning to everybody. I hope you're okay. I hope you're ready for this. Um, just chat away in the chat box if you have any thoughts, right? Um, if you have any questions as well, you can just like pop them on there, but I guess we'll answer them later. Okay, so this is Cancel Diet Culture Nourish Not Punish. My name is Jo Sebastian. So like I said, I am a registered nutritionist and dietitian. Um, one of the questions you might have is, why don't I work in the clinic or all of these things, blah, 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 blah. It's because the pandemic happened. And I think that I was supposed to get a job and then the pandemic happened. So I was like, ah, never mind. It's okay. It's a sign. I'm not going to work. But anyways, that really did fuel me or push me towards the direction where I am now, which is really working freelance as well as trying to find myself in the content that I make and in the people that I get to talk to. So. Before we jump into cancel culture or diet culture in general, I want you to um, answer if you resonate with the following statements. Maybe you don't because maybe you're a dietitian, maybe you're you're already familiar with food, but maybe if you felt it before, if you've gone through these emotions. Okay, here we go. I'm always thinking about food, and not in the sense that oh, okay, I'm a dietitian, I have to think of. Um, these things, or, oh, I'm a chef, I have to think of recipes, but in the sense where you're always thinking about food, when can you eat again, how much have you eaten, Um, or, you know, um, have you eaten enough, and all of these things, right? Okay, yes, I'm saying always. Yeah, so hi. Okay, next one. I fear certain foods because I feel like they'll make me gain weight. Now, of course, we already know the science behind food and eating and all these things, but let's say we didn't. Let's say we go back to pre, um, pre-college days. <laughs> Did you ever have this feeling where you feared certain food would because they you felt like they would make you gain weight, or even now? Because um, even now, sometimes I feel that way. Even if I already know it, right? I already know the the thoughts and the feelings around food, but I still somehow have that fear of making me gain weight. I feel like I have to earn my food for the day. Do you ever feel that? Like, oh, I have to be good. I have to be a good person. I have to work out to earn my food. I have to have had a three, something like that, right? Another one here is I have to, I've gone through this as well, where 
Um, if I ate too much yesterday, I felt like I have to work out twice today so that I could burn it off or I could somehow make up for it. Yes. I feel guilty when I eat, so I end up eating more. You have that feeling where, let's say you ruined your diet and then all of a sudden you're like, oh man, forget it. Restart. Okay, I'll do it again. Do it again. Promise, promise next Monday I can do it like that, right? Because I have felt that for sure. These thoughts are product of diet culture, okay? This is often the things that we think about because of diet culture, because this is what we're taught or this is what we see in the media, not us as dietitians, but us as human beings. This is what we're taught, right? These are the thoughts that are ingrained in our minds and that we are constantly exposed to. First, before we talk about diet culture, we have to first define the difference between diet and dieting. Of course, as NDs, as RNDs, we know that diet is all the food and drink we consume habitually. So anything that you're eating and drinking right now is technically part of your diet. However, the definition has now evolved. As time has gone on and as, as the internet and the media has changed definitions of many words, dieting is now a restrictive diet done to change your body. Right? It's about it's now removing food groups, it's now having specific eating times and all of these things. And most of the time, the motivation is to change your body. It's, it's not necessarily health-wise, it's usually regarding changing your body's appearance. So here are some things that we can find in diet culture, which is your 1,200 calories or less. You have appetite suppressants, right? You have fat burners, detoxes and cleanses. When we know our body can do that on its own if we don't have any specific diseases. Water fasting, keto for weight loss, one meal a day, cheat day, meal skipping, food labeling, and not like nutrition facts, but food labeling is in there's good food, there's bad food, etc. Guilt-free. When we know that guilt is not an ingredient, zero sugar, and then the HCG diet, which is really insane because you even pump yourself up with something, right? And then you have skinny teas, which are just laxatives in general. These things are so popular nowadays, and the problem is they are products of diet culture. Products of diet culture because some of these things are literally sold or literally marketed or made a profit of, right? Your skinny peas and your fat burners and some appetite suppressants are literally profited off by companies. But it's diet culture because these are things that have come up or have been promoted as a way for you to change your body, to get to the body that you feel like is best for you. So what is diet culture? Diet culture is a belief system that values weight, shape, and size over well-being. Diet culture isn't really about what you eat necessarily, but the main concept behind diet culture is that it's a belief system that values weight, shape, and size over well-being. And as dietitians, we know that, you know, okay, um, health is so important. We only have one body. We have to take care of it. We have to nourish it the best we can. However, the media and everything around us constantly tells us that the only way for you to be healthy is if you lose weight. That's the only way. And it doesn't matter how you lose weight. Right? And because of diet culture, because we value shapes, size, and um, how we look over well-being, we get a lot of body comments. If you gain weight, oh, you let, you let yourself go. Right? If you were, if you lose weight, mo na, kumain ka naman, di ba? Or parang every time you're eating, lakas mo naman kumain. Kaya mo talaga ubusin yan, right? You look better before. Alam mo, disiplina lang talaga kailangan mo. Ganon. What happened to your body? Ganon. Maganda ka sana kung mapayat ka, di ba? There's so many comments that we get. Because diet culture tells us that we have to look a specific way. Right? Somebody said relatives who always have things. Yeah. Relatives, friends, people in the internet, right? Everybody wants to say. And it's because we valued how our body looks in connection to health. 
So I have a story. When I was um, struggling through disordered eating patterns, I was skipping meals, I was eating eight bananas a day. Um, I was always complimented. Well, pa- 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 na, share naman ng tips, can I share your secrets. So I felt like, oh, okay. I guess what I'm doing is correct, even though I'm starving and I am feeling and I'm binging in the weekends. I guess what I'm doing is right because people want to know how I did it. And then when I gained weight after trying to recover from these disordered eating patterns, the comments I got was parang lahalahe mo na ay si Ate Jo ang taba taba na ganon. So to my surprise, when I was finally taking care of myself or at least learning to, comments were on how I looked again, right? And it's so easy to let these comments impact you and then, um, what do you call this? Control how you see yourself, make it become your truth, and then it results into disordered eating patterns. Diet culture promotes, promotes the notion that health is equal to thinness. While you can, of course, have specific or better biomarkers when you lose weight, the question is, how are you losing weight? And this, is this actually health-promoting, right? Because health isn't always about weight loss. A lot of the times, it's about the health-promoting behaviors that you have. Okay, yes, you lose 20, 20 pounds in one month, but how do you sustain That's the question. But nobody cares about that. Nobody cares about sustainability and consistency. They just want results. They just want the answer. They just want to see themselves in a different body because either the media has shown them that their body is not good or um, they've been body shamed or maybe they've just been through so much. And because diet culture tells us that you can easily get what you want in a few days, disordered eating habits have become normalized. Skipping meals is now the new trend right? Um, Looking for low-carb options are now the only thing, even if you have no specific condition that needs it, right? Everything has to be low-carb all the time. Everything has to be this much calories all of the time, right? And disordered eating habits like meal skipping or suppressing your hunger has become normalized. And in fact, it's equated with discipline, Right? There's a time when I wasn't eating rice and people would just be like, I saw it all. Yes, work. Disordered eating habits have been equated with discipline. And if you fail your diet, you feel like it's your fault. When at the end of the day, it's really that the diet was not made for you because it was very restrictive. And disordered eating habits are also equated with happiness. If you're able to follow it, you're disciplined enough to fit into society. You're put on a pedestal for being an ideal person who who has challenged their own hunger cues. But dieting becomes a new trend. If you're not on a diet, why? Right? It's like, what? Come on. Diets have become challenges. They become trends. They become something that everybody got got to do together. Cannot. So why do we do it, right? Why do we do it if we know that dieting can be difficult or disordered eating habits can take a toll on us? It's because we're sold shortcuts, weight loss hacks. The you can hack your biology. All you have to do is drink this, and then you'll never feel hungry again. When it's an innate response or an innate thing that your body does is to tell you that you're hungry. Literally, that's one of the things your body does, right? One of the most important things your body does is to tell you if you're hungry. If it didn't, we would not be able to fuel ourselves. But we're sold these weight loss hacks. You'll never feel hungry again. You can speed up your metabolism just by drinking this, not considering your body composition or anything else, right? We're just sold things to hack your body. When we know that biology, our bodies are so smart, they're designed so intelligently, Right? It knows what to do. It knows how to balance its pH. It knows how to go back to homeostasis. Wow, <laughs> big words for me. Sorry. But we are, we are sold these shortcuts and that something's wrong with our body. That's what we're sold. Your body has to detox. It has to cleanse. You have to do this seven-day thing because it's, it's broken. That's what we're sold. We're also sold false promises. Lose weight quick in a week. Right? 30 pounds in 30 days. We're sold these false promises that don't 
tell you a full story of what is happening. Another reason why is because we glorify weight loss. And this is also as a health professional, you have to be careful as well with how you treat your clients and how you address it when they lose weight. Because when somebody loses weight, instead of saying, oh, good job for you, or Allah, first thing you have to ask is, how do you feel about it? Because you don't know how, you can't just react all of a sudden with, oh, yay, good job, or I love it, you know, right? Because you have to be careful with how you address these types of things. So if somebody is has lost weight, if your client or somebody has lost weight, you have to ask them first, how do you feel about this? Or what did we do to get here? Then we can address it there. Because a lot of the times we really glorify weight loss too much and people can say, oh, I lost five pounds. And, and here's the thing, okay, I don't, I'm not against weight loss or anything like that. If that's what you need, if that's what you want, that's okay. What I am looking towards is that it has to come from a place of acceptance of your body. It has to come from an understanding that sometimes what you need is health-promoting behaviors rather than simply changing your body. Another thing is the media. The media also always tells us that weight loss is the ideal thing and that it's really, and you get your sexy body back as if the body that you have now isn't worthy enough. We're always, on, we're always seeing new diets and comments about people's bodies. If some celebrity loses weight, we blast that. Oh, finally, you know, if some celebrity gains weight, we also blast that on the internet, right? We're always just showing about people's bodies rather than about people's accomplishments in life. Dieting promises you acceptance and confidence. Dieting says that if you do this, if you if you follow this thing, you're finally going to have a boyfriend. You're not. Sure. Well, specific. That's a man. Sure. I'm just kidding. But like, that's what happens. Dieting tells you that if you finally fit in this size, if you finally lose 20 pounds, if you finally lose a stubborn belly fat, you'll be happy. You'll be accepted by society and you'll be healthy. But more often than not, they promote unhealthy behaviors rather than actual health-promoting behaviors. Here's the thing. You can't cure body image simply by changing your body. And a lot of the times, we jump into diets because of our relationship with our body. And we can't discount that. Something that you have to remember as a health professional is that we cannot discount the fact that people want to change their bodies because they want to feel accepted. And the fuel for a lot of the things they do is their relationship to their body. And we have to remind them that you can't simply cure body image simply by changing your body. If you have a client that wants to lose weight, you have to first address, okay, why do we want to lose weight? Is it so, is, and if their answer is, oh, it's because I want to feel more confident in my body, then the question is, why can't you feel confident in your body now? What do you think is holding you back? Oh, it's because lots of people comment on my body. It's like, oh, okay. Um, why do you feel affected by their comments? Oh, it's because I was bullied all the time, and it's because I feel like I don't fit the standards. Why don't you feel like you fit the standard? Because you can see all the photos and things that you see online. The media is showing me that my body is so different. Why do you feel like that's a bad thing? Why do you feel like it's bad to have a different body? Again, it's okay if you want to change your body. But you always have to ask why. Because more often than not, it is out of wanting to feel accepted and wanting to feel confident. But even if you lose the weight, it's not a sure thing. Or even if you change your body, it's not going to be a sure thing that you're going to be accepting of your new body. And I say this from experience. When I lost weight and gained weight, when I reached my goal weight, I still never felt happy. I still never felt like I fit the standard. Because at the end of the day, it wasn't about how my body looked. It was about how I took care of it. And it was also about how I thought of it. And as a health professional who deals with people who want to lose weight, want to change their body, you can't discount the fact that body image is a really big factor when it comes to this. Even if it's weight loss for health, you still have to consider what are the aspects that are regarding their body image. So here's some things that they don't usually tell you about dieting, or at least usually tell the media or the world. 
that when you start a diet, especially if it's a restrictive diet, again, when we say diet, this is we are mainly talking about restrictive diets and not what you eat in general. Oftentimes, when you go on a diet, you have a love-hate relationship with yourself. You have difficulty focusing on things because all the thing, only thing you're thinking about is food. When I was doing all of the crazy diets and stuff like that, um, every time I would do work, the only thing I'm thinking about is food. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't get anything done because I'm just hungry. Scrolling on Instagram for food items that you're not necessarily allowed to eat, right? Obsession with calories, food guilt because you feel guilty if you break your diet, loss of period if you're not eating enough, difficulty sleeping, feeling cold all the time, loss of self-trust. Loss of innate cues, meaning you don't trust yourself to tell you when you're hungry. You don't trust yourself to tell you when you're full. You don't trust yourself around specific foods because you feel like if you let yourself eat it, you're never going to stop. Irritability, hair loss from nutrient deficiencies, and lack of energy. These are things about dieting that they don't tell you about, or at least society doesn't tell you about. The only thing they tell you is that if you diet and lose weight, you'll be happy, but they don't tell you the other aspect of it. And that is diet culture. They value shape, size. What is it? Shape, size. And another thing, over well-being. Okay lang, basta pumayat ka, masaya ka na. Promise. And then you question, bakit parang hirap na hirap ako? Why is it when I do it, I always feel hungry, I always feel stressed, and I'm always thinking about food? Is something wrong with me? Am I the outlier in this case? Right? So this is from Atlas Bites Back, which just pretty much shows that when she was restricting food, she lost a lot of hair. But when she started nourishing her body, her hair started to have more opportunities to grow. Because, right, if you're not eating enough, your body's going to prioritize vital bodily functions. Regulating your period and making your hair shiny and smooth is not a priority anymore. So... Oftentimes, you can see that in different in deficiencies. Anyways, dieting leads to one of the most stressful things in the world, which is the binge and restrict cycle. The binge and restrict cycle it starts with a strict rigid diet, deprivation and cravings, binging, shame and guilt, and then purging behaviors. First, it starts with a strict and rigid diet, or first it starts with the idea that you want to change your body or you want to do something about your life or something about your health, and automatically you'll search, how do I become healthy? What's the healthiest diet? And of course, the internet will show you these fad diets. So you jump on it. Okay, this is what I have to be. To, this is what I have to do to be healthy. Boom. So you remove all of your favorite foods, you do all of these things, and you take them all out at once, which leads to deprivation and cravings. And then you're constantly thinking about food. You're constantly craving food. So the moment that you feel like you have one of the foods that you're not allowed to have, sira na diet ko. Start again next week. I promise tomorrow I'll do better. But today I have to eat everything I can so that I won't feel restricted anymore. So it leads to binging. And more often than not, when you're binging, you're eating foods you don't even like. When I binged before, I would... Sometimes I would throw food in the trash can because I'm like, no, no, don't eat this anymore. But I'd go back to it, right? Because we just want to eat something. Sometimes it's not even something we enjoy. Then comes the shame and the guilt from feeling really full or from eating foods you were not allowed to eat. And then oftentimes, but not for all, comes the purging behaviors, which is laxative abuse, exercise bulimia, meal skipping, or self-induced vomiting. So this is the binge and restrict cycle. And this is what happens when you are on a strict and rigid diet that's not, of course, monitored. Again, by the way, the context that we're talking about isn't in a clinical setting or anything like that. It's really in the general healthy population who just want to lose weight or who wants to look a certain way, right? Oftentimes, the feeling of being out of control around food is a result of restriction and not a lack of willpower. And I want you to think about this. Every time you would tell yourself you're not allowed to do something, did you want to do it more? Um, online shopping, sometimes I'd be like, no shop, I know, no, no spend November, you know? and every, everything I wanted goes on sale at that time. And then you're like, what? Right? Because your sense is heightened to this. If you tell yourself you can't eat something, the more you're going to want it. And that's what the difficulty is as well with having patients who have specific restrictions is that the more you tell them you can't have it, the more they're going to want it. And then it's going to be a very difficult um, engagement in that. 
So dieting and um, binging is like a pendulum. The more you you pull to one side, the more you're going to swing to the other. But here's the thing. When you let go, things will slow down and you will find your balance. And a lot of the times we're so afraid to allow ourselves to find that balance. But we can because our bodies are smart. So what is the role of an MD in diet culture? Well, one thing first is you have to define nutrition. From my favorite definition of nutrition, of course, nutrition is the science of food, how to interact with the body, you know, dictionary stuff. But the science and art of nourishing the body properly is my favorite definition. Because, of course, we know it's a science. Literally, there's so much biochemistry and chemistry that it hurts. <laughs> but it's also an art because we have to know that Food goes beyond simply just being fuel for the body. It's part of your culture. It's part of tradition. It's part of memories and comfort. And it's part of coping with life. And that's okay. Because food has evolved in its definition over time. And our relationship with food has evolved as well. But as MDs, we have to remember and we have to... Um, what do we call this? We have to promote the idea that food is a very important of life, uh, important part of life. Because apart from it simply being nourishment for your body, it's also part of living. I mean, how many events and how many um, holidays do you remember having specific food items on that day? Another important thing for us to do is to remember or to teach people that eating is a part of life or teach them to see eating as a part of life rather than as a way to change your body. Well, yes, you can change your body through eating and through exercise. We have to first prioritize allowing them to see how food is a great big part of life. And that's an important thing. We also have to remember to promote healthy habits over quick results. Okay? Um, one thing you have to remember is even if you have specific calculated calories, you have a target of one to two pounds per week, you can't always get that result because everybody responds to things differently. So instead of promoting, oh, it's okay, yeah, we'll be able to lose eight pounds this month, we can promote healthy habits over quick results. Right? It's hard to make promises. What we want to do is to first show them that healthy habits is really, really important. Right? The foundation is, more, is the most important thing that we have to look into. We also have to detach the act of eating from the assumption that we should all be losing weight. While weight loss can, of course, increase um, biomarkers and all of these things, we have to remember and detach the connection from weight loss and eating. Yes, they are connected, but we have to remember that that's not all it is. Right? That's not all eating is. People also eat when they're emotional and stressed, so we have to give them tools to cope with that as well. And to remember that health is more than just food. Health is also about sleep, about movement, about self-talk, about your mental care for yourself, and it's about so much more than just what you eat. Sustainability is something that we always have to promote as professionals especially when we're dealing with, um, you know, the average population, not, again, clinical, uh, clinical um, in a clinical setting, okay? So, we have to teach them to unlearn diet culture and relearn their bodies. Because diet culture will give you all of these rules and tell you not to trust your body, but we know that your body is really, really smart. It's really, really great at doing things for you. When you're sick, it's gonna fight it. When you are hungry, it's gonna tell you you have to eat, right? And we have to relearn how to listen to our body and to listen to our body's cues. What makes us feel satisfied? And of course, as an ND, we have to translate evidence-based information into everyday habits. Yes, of course, show them the studies, all of these things, but more likely, they will listen to an influencer who has done it in their life and shows the results, right? So what can we do as an MD? We translate these evidence-based information into everyday habits. Instead of saying, oh, of course, of course, you can give the 
background, the science information, but likely they won't understand that. They won't get that. So we have to translate it into something they will understand, whether into their everyday habits or simply showing them that it's doable. So remember that food can be a tool to reach optimum health. And not just food as something you, you eat, but food as something you connect with your mental and social health as well, right? WHO says that um, health is a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Wow. So food can be a tool, not just physically, but mentally and socially as well to help you reach optimum health. And we have to remember that when we approach our clients, when we approach um, the all of these things, right? Yes, memorize ko siya because one time tinanong siya sa akin sa class and I didn't know it. So I memorized it. Okay, we learn from our mistakes. All right, anyways, food can be a tool to reach optimum health. Our bodies are more than just about how they look. We have to remember health is from within. You cannot judge somebody's health just by looking at them, right? As an ND, we always get, what's the healthiest food for, for me to lose weight? When you don't know anything about them, how are you going to answer this? Context is so important. And just because somebody looks a specific way doesn't mean we get to judge their health right away. We have to first know the A, B, C, D, E of everything, right? And that's our, that's our job as NDs is to know the context of the person and approach them in a way that they can turn it into everyday habits rather than a one-time quick thing. And we also have to preach the importance of habits over quick results. Habits. Because yes, yes, it's, it's what do you call it? Yes, you get results from it. Yes, you see quick changes. But is it actually something that is health-promoting in the long run? Yes, you can do it, but did you need to do it? And what's the repercussions in your body for that? So, yeah, that's that's all for that. That's all I'm here to say. <laughs> Remember, um, one of the things I have to always say is that you always deserve to eat. That's my Instagram. That's my email. If you guys have anything else, but if you have any questions now, let's go. All right. Thank you so much, Miss Jo. Grabe. Parang... I'm sitting here and I'm like trying to think, grabe, it, it's like an information overload right now, but in a good way, because there's so much, parang, kung somebody even chatted me na, parang tago sa bones yung mga, yung mga what Miss Jo has talked about. So I'm really thankful for that, Miss Jo. And we're so happy that you are here sharing your expertise with us. Like one of my highlights were really that we as NDs and even, you know, us that are aware about the uh, conditions of health should always, always be promoting be um, health, healthy behaviors and good behaviors before just really thinking about the results. No, we have to establish that. So um, where's my partner? Hi, Rose. <laughs> Hello, Dor. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I am Jan Kapala. So, Ika Rose, what are your... Of all the things that Miss Jo talked about, grabe no, I know we learned so much. What was your highlight? Uh, for me, uh, what really got me is when Miss Jo quoted, I fear certain foods because I feel like they'll make me gain weight. Uh, same. Honestly, no, the, I think all of us have went through that. Now we think that certain types of food make us gain weight and um, I can totally relate to Miss Jo being also a part of, um, you know, trying social media with TikTok and all that. I get so many questions about, like, which food is healthy? Parang tagos talaga to when she said na, we are always asked, which food is healthy, which food isn't? And, you know, we can't really say. We can't really say without knowing the entirety of the diet of one person, no one food should be, quote, unquote, unhealthy. It can all be incorporated incorporated in a healthy diet so grabe no um I, I do believe our audience do have questions for later on and um rose sige sobrang jay ka na ako <laughs> yes ano? sige. oh yeah yeah let's uh, you know what nor i could totally relate to that because you know in this time of pandemic we are really more prone of eating more since we're stuck right. at home and like before nakakagala lang anytime and I always feel guilty when I eat all that time and having the fear of gaining weight. Can anyone relate to this? 
But however, I'm also learning that sustainability is the key and that food can be a tool to reach optimum health because our bodies are more than just how they look. So I really like this quote from Ms. Jo. <laughs> wow. Grabe, no? Kamu guys, do you have any quotable quotes from this discussion today? Let me see in the in the chat section. Oh, sabi ni Kim, true. <laughs> Supportive talaga si Kim. Thank you, Miss Kim. <laughs> All right. Sige. So, anyone else? Anong mga reactions ninyo? Post- Any positive? reactions, guys? Oh, sige. Okay. Siguro pareha sila na to, Rose. They're still mm-hmm. thinking. They're trying to absorb everything kasi it was so information dense, but Really something to ponder on when we're done with this no webinar. So, <laughs> sige, let's proceed with our next part of our program. I do believe we have questions. Some of them really PM'd us no and said, na, Hala, can you do a recording for this? Can you post? Because we want to re, re, um, listen because grab it, so information kind of rich. So, sige, let's continue to our next part of the program for the questions. All right. So now let us proceed to one of the awaited moments, our open forum or Q&A segment, which will be facilitated by our two handsome co-interns, Mr. Mr. Jacob Mahina and Mr. Kyle Herente. Hi, Hi, Jacob. Hi, Kyle. Hi, guys. guys. Good morning. (laughs) Good morning, Jacob and Kyle. Morning. Okay. Okay lang. How about you, Jacob? Kumusta ka dyan? Nakamute ka, Jacob. I'm okay, bro. How about you? How about our uh, participants for today? Participants. So, okay, kal- uh, okay lang kayo dyan? <laughs> so, now... Uh, so- I am looking at the chat box for questions that our audience members have sent in. So, in order to not go over time, so I'd like to choose around three to five questions for our speakers to be asked. So, uh, there were questions uh, before. So, let me scan first. So, the question. So, oh, this is for Miss Kim. So, this is the first question, no? So, Miss Kim, so someone asked, uh, this is specifically Miss Angela. So, she asked if, uh, hindi po ba nawawala yung nutrients doon sa food, especially po doon sa vegetable? Okay. So, thank you, Miss Angela, for like sending your question. And it is a really good question. But with regards to, you know, vitamins and minerals, the whole freezing aspect, is it necessarily a concern? Because especially to us who have this background of, you know, um, food and nutrition and food science, vitamins and minerals are often lost through kind of heating, through water, through the presence of fat. So freezing doesn't necessarily cause your ingredients to lose these things. What you may be concerned about is, I guess, texture, but you just have to play around with um, what kind of cooking method you use. For example, this, you know, it's common in the grocery, right? You have frozen vegetables. So I guess it's true that they're mushier than if you eat it fresh. But if you add it to like, if you add it like, if you use a dry heat method or if you use a sauce, it will be less noticeable. Same thing with meat. So it's more of like a texture and not so much the nutritive quality of it. Okay. Thank you for that wonderful answer, Miss Kim. So I hope uh, Miss Angela has something and uh, learn about uh, your answer. So, Ms. Angela, is there anything else you want to add or follow-up question for that? Wala na po. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Can I also just add that it's something I find mm-hmm. funny that when it was my turn to speak, like the MCs and the hosts like were speaking in English and then it was Ms. Jo. It's like you could read it to Tagalog. <laughs> it's just funny. We adapt. <laughs> Uh, Jacob, uh, do you, uh, did you find another question for our speaker, uh, for Miss Kim or Miss Jo? You're on mute, Jacob. No, I didn't find any questions for Miss Kim, but there is a question from 
Miss Gift to Miss Joy. Is Miss Joy? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm still so, alive. Yes. So, how would someone timid talk to people who are so who are so aggressively convenient about a certain diet that worked for them and are forcing others to do it? Mm, okay, very interesting. So. First, you have to um, know your limits as to how much you can talk to somebody. Because sometimes you can do everything you want to do. You can say everything you can. You can do everything right, but they're not going to listen. So you have to set boundaries as to know as to knowing who you're talking to. If that person is really not going to listen, don't waste your energy on them anymore because it's not going to work. It's not. And you don't want to spend all of your energy and time talking to that person. When you know that people who follow them and support them are going to start attacking you as well. Right? So you have to know the difference between fighting for something that you can actually fight for or fighting for something that is a lost cause. At the end of the day, if you feel like someone is doing something that is um, hurting other people and convincing other people to do something that is not good for health, make your own platform, stand for your own thing, or find somebody who will stand, who has the same stance as you and promote them. Right? Because if you feel like you're not ready to do that for yourself, to talk about it and And to get that message out there, find other people who can and support them to do that for you. Because we know our limits, we know our boundaries, we can't do everything. And that's just something we have to accept. But that's just what we can start with. First, start with creating those habits for you, showing people that it works. And then find people who show the same thing. And people will be inspired by that on its own. So I hope that was helpful. So thank you for that very wonderful answer, Miss Jo. So give okay, Naka. Yes, thank you so much, Miss Jo. <laughs> okay, so so, so you... we're for our oh. next question, no? So oh, here uh, we have one from Miss Kim. So is this for Miss Jo, right? Uh, so what would you tell other NDs, RNDs who also want to break into social media? media like you since it seems to help in convincing people you know i just want to tell you just do it because if you're going to keep waiting for somebody else to do it let's say okay like yes if you see somebody doing it then go for it but if you feel like you have a very specific message a very different message then do it because everybody is different in the way that they deliver things and not everybody is perceptive to the way other people deliver things right um the way i tend to deliver my message just more on like from experience based on my experience some people will do it very factual and very scientific based some people relate to experience based information some people relate to more showing me all of the studies like straight up right so um find what you feel is best for you what kind of mode you want to do best and then just do it because we need more professionals we need more people who will actually preach the message correctly You already have so many influencers who are going to keep on pushing these things, pushing supplements, pushing MLMs, pushing things to individuals. So the thing you can do as an ND and R&D is make the message, start the message, make it grow, right? You don't have to have perfect messaging or anything like that. It doesn't have to be super duper nicely made infographs. Though those help, just start with what you can. Some people like paragraphs. Some people like infographs. So find your niche. And then, and then just work from there and enjoy it. Enjoy it, of course. Okay, thank you for that, Miss Jo. So I think someone from our, from my co-intern who can relate to that. So this is Miss Dorothy Gale. <laughs> Di ba, Dor? Grabe <laughs> kayo. When Miss Jo was talking, I was like, is she talking about me? <laughs> Joke lang. But um, everyone, this webinar is actually one great way to empower one another as NBs. Or R and Ds, you know, um, the world really needs us. And I understand that not everyone is um, into social media, ganon. But like what Miss Jo said, find people who can also support you in that, or find people that you can, you know, push to to really do that as well. Because we have a voice. Wow, <laughs> speech to. <laughs> so we have something to say. Pinag-aralan natin to guys for four years and even counting. Learning is never ending. So if you guys have something to say that is, of course, factual, evidence based, and just go for it, like what Miss Jo said. So 
That's what I can say. <laughs> Salamat, Kyle and Mr. Joe. <laughs> so, oh, here uh, from our chairman, so from Mr. John Rafael. So, uh, this is for Miss Kim. So, Miss Kim, so he asked, uh, what are budget friendly food combination would you like to recommend to individuals who have a tight budget or those university students who conveniently just buy food in the cafeteria? Okay. So there are a lot of actually things you could do, but the first thing I would actually also say is there's nothing wrong with bread. If that's all you can afford, especially since, you know, a lot of bread we can see in the grocery, sliced bread, wheat bread, we can see the nutrition facts. At least we're aware of what goes in that. And from there, we can always just elevate it. You know, as I said, you know, university students, how much is our budget for a meal? 50 pesos or less? Diba? So if all you can afford is like, kato, um, a canned good, find a way to extend it. Um, example, if all you, I'll let's use the most common one, tuna and sardine. Okay, diba? Even if mga um, relief goods, that's what we give. Okay? That's what's really readily available. How can you extend these things in order to make them more nutritious, to make them bigger in amount? That's in that one you can do is add kato, add your root crops, add your mixed vegetables. What are cheap vegetables? One sayote, diba? You can always add malunggay. That's so cheap. Diba? You can get it from your silingan. So, kana. Um, for those with tight budgets, I just have to say, work with what you can. Work what's in your budget. And, you know, <laughs> there is laughing at my... You can get it from your silingan um, nga comment. For kana. Um, you know, you don't have to put yourself to a standard similar to what you see on social media. I know, like, a lot of influencers say, kana, broccoli and kale and, you know, mga detox, whatever, juices, or even though that's bad, pero... You don't have to put yourself at that similar standard when it comes to food and nutrition. Because, you know, vegetables have nutrients. It doesn't have to be these soup, considered superfoods. Work with what you have. Um, and for those with tight budgets, to, um, find out what is in season and what is local in your market. I think now, for example, cabbage is still very cheap. Kay grabe ang surplus. So you can always add that to your food. You can add that to rice para madaghan imuhang like fried rice or whatever. You can add that to your sardines to make a patty, add flour. Like how much man is flour? It can last long pa. So, kana lang. Know what's in your market, know what's cheap, know what's in season. Yes, that's true. So, thank you for that, Miss Kim. So, uh, from our audiences, uh, do you have any questions? I see familiar faces here. Uh, Ivan, are you there? <laughs> Morning. My question talaga to siya. Ivan, hello. Or from our uh, fellow R&Ds in the audience, do you have any questions or thoughts you want to share? How about to Lester? Is Lester here? Oh, okay. So while we're waiting for the others, I actually have a question for Miss Jo. Or Jo. <laughs> yeah, Jo. Um, so, Jo, um, diba, we've heard about the health at every size movement. So, do you think this can be taken out of context considering that, um, you know, not to judge, but some are like, you know, uh, if we see it um, morbidly obese or ganon, um, what do you think we should, as R&D, should stand in terms of that movement? Okay, great question. So I can't tell you where to stand, but I'll just tell you my thoughts on it. So okay. um, haze or health at every size, we have to remember it's not healthy at every size. That's the difference, health at every size. Because the movement says that everybody should have the same health care, um, the same access to health care. Why? It's very common in the, um, in the health, in the place oh my god <laughs> wherever people go um it's very common to be what do you call it discriminated upon based on your size and based on your body larger you'll find this very um often in hospital settings where as soon as you get there the first thing that they'll say is you have to lose weight instead of first uh, assessing what are your habits what are all of these things yun yung unang sasabihin i know this because um 
I've seen a lot of cases upon it. I also have a lot of clients who tell me they have PCOS and their doctor just said lose weight. They don't even tell you how. They don't even tell you who to go to. They just tell you you have to lose weight, right? Health at every size basically says that everyone should have the same opportunities when it comes to health care. That it shouldn't be, there shouldn't be bias upon that. Not just because you're in a larger body, ibig sabihin, you automatically have to lose weight at yun lang yung bagawing goal right away, right? So, Yes, there are people who have to really develop or change habits, but coming from that side of health at every size, we know that they deserve the same treatment we give to everybody, and we can't judge them just based on how they look. Some people who are overweight, they don't they don't overeat naman or anything like that. There's just a lot of things that are going on in their body, or there's a lot of habits that they have developed over time that they have to address or adjust. Right, So it's just realizing that health is a spectrum of so many things and you can't simply judge somebody with the size of their body and you have to approach them in the same way you approach everyone else. Why do you want to lose weight? What are the things that we can change? What are some of the things that, what are the, what are the things that are keeping us where we're at? Right, So that's health at every size where people associated with healthy at every size. Now you can just not care what other people do, basta masaya sila sa katawan nila. Which that's the difference as well between body positivity and then self-care. People can misconstrue it. Now, if you eat a salad, hindi ka na body positive. If you go work out ka, hindi ka body positive. Diba? So there's always a spectrum of everything. But for me, when you say health at every size, it's really just looking that everyone has a different story and you can't judge them or treat them a specific way just because they look that way. So I hope that helped. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much for clarifying that joke. Because I've been like wondering what that actually meant. So thank you. Going back to Kyle. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Dorothy and Miss Jock. So, any other questions or thoughts from our audiences? Don't be shy, guys. <laughs> Uh, uh, tayo tayo lang to dito, guys. So you can really yeah. ask, or if you just can, you can unmute yourself. You can ask the question directly. Mm-hmm. How about si Angela? I'm so glad you're here, Angela. Thank you for. Ah, uh, meron po ng tanong kay Miss Joko. Um, paano po yung magiging approach natin para dun sa mga taong interesado makinig sa atin po? What they mean? <laughs> like, talk to them. <laughs> Wait, lang, can I get more context into your question? Because like, yeah. Yung sa mga uh, ano po yung mga magiging approach natin dun sa mga taong willing pong makinig sa atin na may mga restriction po sa diets nila. Ah, you mean parang pag meron silang clinical um situation, may restrictions talaga sila. Okay. Ah, okay. So. Um, this is my. This is what I do. Huh? This is not what you have to do, or not what everybody does. This is just what I do all the, uh, most of the time. Is um, even if they have a specific disease, you have to make sure instead of telling them not to eat something, to eat something else, right? Instead of telling them don't eat this, don't eat this, you can eat this. Why? Because there's a psychological or mental aspect of it. Where pag pinagbawalan mo sila, medyo mas may isipan nila. So instead of telling them not to eat something, promote something else for them to focus on. So parang in a way, it's in like um in the worst way to say it is create a distraction for them instead of focusing on what they have to remove, teach them or show them what they have to add or what they can replace. Always give them a direction. You always have to give the your client a direction. Hindi po ay ah wag mo na gawin wag mo na gawin and tapos wala kang bibigay na um what for them to move forward with. So my approach is always just teach them about what their condition is and why this is what you need. What this is why why this is what they need to do. For example, if it's insulin resistance, bakit gusto mo ng um, lower um, higher fiber carbohydrates? Bakit gusto mo space out your meals? What's the importance of that? And then give them alternatives so that they don't feel like they have to navigate it all on their own. So I hope that was helpful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for that, Angela and Ms. Jo again. So any others? Uh, from our audiences. So our okay. So I think that was all the questions for now. 
So Jacob, yeah, uh, uh, what was so, your learning about the our Q and A uh, session so, this morning? Ko andro kay no na dagan jo kay tag knowledge nga na learn today from our speakers Miss Kim and Miss Jo. So thank you everyone who sent their questions and to our lovely speakers for accommodating our audiences. So. So that was really a lot of food for thought, and we hope our viewers have learned something. So to Miss Kim and Miss Jo, thank you again thank you. for joining us here today and for imparting your knowledge about diet canceling. That was really informative and life changing. We have learned so much at this event. Okay. So right now for the uh, for our next part of our program. So uh, we. Uh, for the certificate, so uh, our representative and affiliate institution will be in contact to our speakers regarding for the certificate of appreciation. So on behalf of the Changwa Hospital, Cebu and Cebu Doctors University Clinical Interns of Batch 2021. So again, Ms. Jo, thank you very much. Any final words would you like to say? And do you have, uh, do you have something you want to plug? Any social media accounts where our participants can follow you on? So um, I just want to say thank you guys. Um, I'm really excited for all of your journeys as RNDs, future RNDs and MDs and all of those things. Just make sure to stick to your values. Don't let anybody push you down. Oh. <laughs> and of course, make sure to fight diet culture. But if you guys want to ask me anything or if you just want to um, talk, talk about frustrations of being an R&D, you can just check out my Instagram. That's at it's Joe Sebastian. You can also check out my YouTube and TikTok, but, you know, that's all up to you. It's all, it's, what's that? Just take care of yourselves and, you know, make sure you um, stick to your values. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you, miss. Uh, how about Miss Kim? Do you have any final words for our, from our participants and audience? Just um, thank you for being here, guys. And thank you for being open-minded about what we had to say. Um, you know, diet culture, uh, diet culture, diet canceling, it's an interesting topic, really. And there's a lot of controversies about it. But that's why we have this kind of, you know, webinar. And that's why we encourage this kind of open discussion. Because, you know, as, as, as Ms. Jo had told us and he met before this webinar, you know, we're all students of life and learning never stops. So we have to keep an open mind and it's keep learning, keep like, and also, it's our responsibility also to share what we know to other people. That's really also why I you know, was excited to do this, even though it was my first time, because I wanted to talk to you guys about this. So, kind of. Right. So, thank you so much, Miss Kim. And thank you, Miss Jo, for that very informative message. You're such an, an inspiration to us, aspiring to be re registered nutritionist dietitian. So... Before we end our webinar, we would now like to call on our outstanding teacher and BND faculty advisor for the closing remarks, Mr. LD Guguden. Hello, sir, LD. Good morning. Thank you, Rose, for that very kind na ko an introduction. So na wingi ko gamay sa outstanding, but nevertheless, thank you so much. So to Miss Joanne May Perian uh, Navales, the chief dietitian of Chongwa Hospital. Cebu, to our department chairman, Mr. John Rafael Aranias, um, the practicum preceptor or coordinator in Chungwa Hospital, Ms. Hai Rose, and dietitians from the institution, my fellow faculty member, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. So first and foremost, I would like to express my appreciation to Ms. Kim for her lecture, as well as to Ms. Jo for that very informative na lecture. Uh, my deepest gratitude also uh, goes to the audience who attended and who listened no, to this webinar. So may this webinar be an instrument no, that we can spread more knowledge to our people, to uh, the community uh, with regards to diet culture. No? So it is very important that we need to raise awareness, we need to improve the knowledge of the people in the community so that they can reach no, the optimum health nga maka, maka tabang sa ila to you know, uh, go on with their lives. So Kim discussed a lot of things. No? Uh, she even uh, gave us recommendation 
uh, on how to prepare meals nga easy lang siya and also um, one thing that i really uh, appreciate about the lecture of miss jo escatong naingon siya no that you can cure body image by changing your body so it is a challenge to us or sa inyo ha no especially that you will be, be become future rnds that you need to translate evidence based information into uh, everyday habits so pinaka common or pinaka so na siya uh, redundant na kay nga saying na katong sa unang estudyante pa mi hangtod karon uh, sige gyapon or pwede gyapon na to gamiton we always practice what we have to preach to our people so congratulations interns for this successful web, uh, webinar so again uh, let's help no spread the importance of good nutrition so remember that diba food can be a tool uh, to reach the optimum health so again thank you all for being part of this webinar today and taking the time patiently to listen to what our speakers have discussed i wish you all a blessed uh, day ahead and uh, according to sir john kaganina sa iyahang opening remarks we may live healthily ever after thank you everyone and stay safe Thank you so much, Sir LD, for those inspiring words. I know that grabe, we have learned so much in this uh, webinar, not just from Miss Jo, from Miss Kim, but also from you, sir, because you are our um you are our kidding college nag handle sa muasa in most of our major subjects. So salamat kayo, sir, for being with us here today. Nga. Supportado jud kayo mo along with Sir John and the rest of um the faculty as well. I see Miss JM here as well. So salamat for that. Thank and... you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be part of your professional journey. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much again. So we will definitely make sure now what we learn from this program will be applied by in heart and in practice as well. So to end this program, no, I don't I don't I don't want it to end, but there is endings to everything, I know. But we would like to thank our viewers for attending our webinar today. And I hope that we will continue on with um really spreading nutrition information facts. All right. Now, we would like to ask everyone to please evaluate our webinar using the given link at the chat box as the e-certificates will be given after your evaluation. We would also like to congratulate our team for preparing this successful and web memorable webinar. Let's give ourselves a big round of applause for doing a great <laughs> job for this event. All right. Thank you so much, team. For those who don't know, actually, um, uh, this webinar is actually one of our culminating activities for the last leg of our clinical internship. All right. <laughs> so we're so happy at the same time sad because we were already done. So with that, can we all request everyone to turn on their webcams for a bit? Okay, mag picture taking muna tayo. So this is for documentation purposes. <laughs> <laughs> yung background ni Gino na no? nakakatawa. Sige, okay lang yan. Alright, so may we on turn on our cameras. Uh, Mr. Ong will take the photo. Um, please guide us, Mr. Ong. Ay, unmute lang muna yung ang um, mic. Okay, so I'm gonna count from 1 to 5. 5 to 1. And everybody should be turning on their cameras na. And so... May I call the other participants to turn their camera on for documentation purposes? Thank you. All right. So, five, four, three, two, one. Smile. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, it has been a wonderful journey indeed, right? Agree, mga co-interns. <laughs> and yeah. we are thankful to have, re have everyone, um, you know, celebrate it with us through this webinar. And um, Rose, anything to add? All right. Thank you, everyone. This means so much to us. So this has been Rose Dean Arnado. 
and Dorothy Saldura with the Cebu Doctors University Clinical Interns of Batch 2021. Remember, nutrition facts, not nutrition fiction. Spot on! So let's become a source of evidence-based nutrition, not misinformation. Have a great day, everyone! Bye! Bye, everyone! Happy lunch! I early yeah. today, but happy lunch later. later. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys.